We're the ASU Devils then. This is episode 84, the mid-July edition of the podcast. Welcome back, Don Hansen. Don, how are you? Very good. How are you, Rob? Trying to throw you off with a different intro. Did I do it? I'm ready. I'm always ready for you. Uh, the World Cup is over. Derek World Jeter. Cup's over. Derek Jeter has now played his final Major League Baseball All-Star game. Marvel announced that Thor is going to be a woman. July has been a month of finality. I don't know how Thor is going to be a woman. Is it going to be Ch- China, maybe? <laughs> China, yeah. That's awesome. Thor is going to be a woman. Thor for yeah. Thor for what? Um, the, in their car, in their comics. Oh, in their comics. Okay. Yeah, it hasn't it hasn't approached the cinematic universe yet. This is a different Thor than the Thor that we've now seen two movies of in the franchise. I'm assuming. Oh no, it's, it's they're separate, right? The cinema, cinema, what is it? Cinema, cinematic universe is the movies with Josh mm-hmm. Whedon. Mm-hmm. Is you know his loose, name? Good job. I didn't. <laughs> lo- loosely based on comics. Yeah. And the Marvel comic universe, they announced that Thor is going to be a woman in the new. In the new version of the Thor comic books. Ah, okay. So the closure would be that, who knows, maybe in Avengers 3, Thor becomes a woman. Who knows? It would make a added dimension to the famous question of, how swings thy hammer? Oh, whoa. Yeah. You know, we don't talk politics on this show. We, we might make references to other things, but we definitely don't talk politics. But... Former ASU and NFL quarterback Andrew Walter who sits among the faces on the Mount Rushmore of Sun Devil quarterbacks is, of course, running for a seat in the House, representing Arizona's 9th Congressional District. We mentioned this because, as we posted on Facebook this week, he's hosting an evening of alcohol. I, I quote this. Evening of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms this upcoming Friday. Thousand dollars get you 250 rounds. You get to fire from three weapons. 250 bucks gets you a box of rounds. And I read this wrong the first time, Don, which is the funny part. But shots from a Glock 18. Now, originally when I saw this, I thought alcohol, and they figured out like a cool way instead of a shot luge, a way to do shots out of a Glock. Not safe. Please do not try that at home. We do not suggest this. But it's actually squeezing the trigger on a Glock 18. So, is this something, Don, that you would ever go to? Oh, wow, Rob. I don't... <laughs> would you support a Sun Devil quarterback and go to his political rally or dinner? I'm not sure that that all those go together. Politics, out, first of all, I don't think politics and alcohol go together. That's never good. And then politics, alcohol, and firearms, that just... Mm. Well, well, you know the deal with the alcohol is there is no alcohol while you're shooting at the range. It's, mis- it's misleading. They're going to do that afterwards, which made me very, very disappointed. I thought, why not just take care of two things at the same time? Darwin steps in and boom, there you go. This is just... Um... This is really interesting. Let's just put it that way. Can I tell you that I went to my first ever gun show... On the 4th of July, how do you know I live in Colorado? Because you were too busy going to all the weed shows? I have not been to a weed show. Uh, I went to a gun show in Wyoming, in rural Wyoming, of all places. $4. You get in. You're allowed to hang out the entire week. It was our weekend. It was, it was a three-day extravaganza in Guernsey, Wyoming, population of, I think, just over 750 I'm out there camping in the sticks near a lake, by the way. But there just so happened to be a gun show in town. Very interesting. A couple of very nice older gentlemen, all vets. Very nice. So I don't know anything about 
guns really my brother is an avid gun collector and i'm looking and i'm just going through on my own i probably should not be left alone in one of these shows in this small room full of guns with people that you know i'm just going to start to agitate a little bit so the question i came up with was i noticed that there were british rifles and handguns there were german rifles and handguns from world war ii uh there were obviously uh, American, uh, I think there was like an M1 Garand there. And I stopped and one of the gentlemen asked me if I had any questions. And I said, yeah, where, where, where are all the Japanese handguns and rifles? And um, let's just say wasn't a very uh, thoughtful answer by that gentleman. Good to see there's a little bit of racism and hatred still in uh, small town Americana, Don. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about eligibility on uh, this episode. We'll talk to you about uh, kids coming in, getting ready for fall camp, who's in so far, who's still on the fence, who isn't going to be playing football for ASU this year. We'll talk about award watch nominees. Uh, We'll talk some recruiting news. Happy to have Don back for that. How can you top a month, Don, like June, as far as the commits we saw, those five players during that month? Uh, We'll continue talking about Pac-12 position previews amongst the conference. Uh, This episode, it's going to be the best of the best, and there's not a ton of them at running back, Don. Um, We'll we'll kind of mull that over. Uh, Lots of established talent left in the offseason. Got four guys that got drafted. Uh, We'll talk with Pete Romito of quarterbackhitlist.com. He's going to tell us about what he's been seeing from guys like Bryce Perkins and Brady White over at the Elite 11. We'll talk about the band of the week, swim through frequencies from the non-crap part of Fort Collins, Don, and uh, what we've been drinking. you got two months to catch up on with that, Don. So you can get in touch with us, as always, on Twitter, on Facebook. We need to catch up on Facebook, so get on there. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know what you think of the team. ASU in general, talk about the stadium. You can shoot us an email, podcast at asudevilsden.com. iTunes, Stitcher, please remember, as always, people will not find us sometimes or other ways without you leaving a nice, wonderful rating about how we do on this show, how we don't drink IPAs on this show, things like that. Uh, Leave that on iTunes. You can find us in the forums on dieharddevil.com. Go over there, sign up for an account. You can interact with Don and I. You can say nice things or not so nice things. You can not laugh at my ridiculous humor. All that, dieharddevil.com. Don, you've been killing it over there lately. So I I just, you know me, I am a thread killer. I try to put a joke out there and generally I'm like 95% thread killer. Thread killer. All right. It's been a while. Let's talk a little bit about this football team. Let's talk about the incoming recruiting class, the JUCO players, the freshmen and their status. Don, I'm just going to hand it over to you. As far as JUCOs go, we know that there's always going to be a risk with this team when you bring in junior college players. They're guys that some of them uh, have had issues as far as getting credits. Some of them have had issues as far as what they've done to not deserve a division one scholarship why don't you give us a a little bit uh, of an update on what's going on right now as far as the ASU roster so rob uh, we talk about it every year the junior college players it's always a, a scramble during the summer to ensure that they get on campus for fall practice the the biggest and most recent one was the the saga of last season waiting to see if Jalen Strong would make the roster. Uh, then you had the issue of Demarius Randall who came in in shape, but he had a you know, but he got hurt. Which players can get hurt no matter what, but there's always the the conditioning question with the JC players. Um, it, it's it's high risk high reward with these players. Where we're at right now is is there is some chatter on message boards, but Doug Holler was the first to go public with it, that ASU signee Darius Caldwell will not enroll uh, this fall at ASU. Uh, as you all know, Caldwell was the, the junior college player who was 
determined to go to an SEC school but couldn't get in there because of academic issues with classes and, and ended up signing with his uh, Pearl River fellow player, Delvin Stuckey. Um, more important, this was at a position of need. There are no upperclassmen that kind of fit the hand-in-the-ground devil backer position. Uh, and so this kind of causes yet another wrinkle to a defense uh, that is trying to replace nine starters and got thrashed in its bowl game. Amongst amongst two games with Stanford as well. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me about that. Game too. <laughs> um, You're a big and, boy football, as you put it. And then, you know, the other one, is, the other big one is Dalvin Stuckey, who is people are envisioning who can step in immediately and play for Will Sutton. That, and first of all, don't set those high expectations for him just yet. He's got to get on campus first, then you have to see if he's in shape and whether he can pick up the defense that quickly. Um, he is still not on campus yet. So so I think we talked about this in the last podcast, but the, the class actually was due to show up on campus toward the end of June. Um, the, the majority of freshmen did, uh, incoming freshmen did, and then their, the junior college players are, are trickling in as they finish up their coursework. It, it sounds like potentially Stucky might be reporting in a week or so as long as he finishes up that classwork. Uh, what about the freshmen? So the freshmen all appear on campus ready to go. You know, if you follow a lot of you on social media, you follow them. You know, you've seen pictures of Manny Wilkins and Kalen Ballage in the locker room after a workout. Um, you know, Sam Jones was posting pictures of, of you know, hiking the mountains and, and Salt River on one of the weekends. So a lot of the players are already getting themselves acclimated, getting themselves work, you know, used to the 6 a.m. workout schedule. There are two players that aren't here right now. Um, running back to Mario Richard is, is the big one that everybody kind of knows about because he was so vocal on Twitter. Uh, his Twittering has, uh, has died down, Rob. So somebody must have had a little conversation with him. There, there's clearly some frustration on his part between the clearinghouse and his high school and some classes and syllabus, and, and we'll have to see what happens there. Thankfully, the running back position is a, is a deep position. Uh, he, you know, it was probably a good, like, the chance that he was going to redshirt anyway. Um, not really the impact of Caldwell right now. Uh, but Ishmael Murphy Richardson still isn't on campus yet. There is a, some questions about him. Um, and that's got to get cleared up. And I think we, we kind of have to call our buddy Kevin Stewart to get more details on that. But as of right now, we just know that IMR is not on campus, which he was slated to try to play the devil backer position as well. He probably physically wasn't ready enough to start and play devil backer. Um, but it's just another hit to that, that position. So for sure, no Caldwell. Potentially, at this point, it's looking a little bit scary with Ishmael Murphy Richardson. So let's talk to me really quickly about what this devil backer position is going to look like in a couple weeks when players start lining up at their defensive positions. Chance Cox, Viliami Latou, Arikio Florence, and potentially Antonio Logino if they want to shake up the linebacking core a little bit. So... What's your thoughts on this right now other than scary? Yeah, it's pretty scary. I mean, it's this is something that, that the team's going to have to fill out. You know, maybe maybe they go a little more traditional 4-3, Rob, you know, because they have Hardison, Cherry, Hood, you know, and maybe like a, one of those freshmen like Humphreys or Wren or the GAC transfer like Botang's ready to play. And maybe they do go a little more traditional 4-3. Um, maybe they go 3-3-5. Three, three, I don't know, but it, it's pretty scary because if you, if you just – all we could do is comment on what we've seen, right? And so what we've seen over the past two years is this devil backer position has been the guy who puts his hand down and his assignment's been to go after the quarterback. Easier said than done. Bradford was a freakish athlete. He wasn't tall, but he was physically powerful, quick, had the moves. Um, We saw some tremendous athletic plays from him at that position. It's a playmaking position. 
that's just been the scheme the last couple of years. So they're going to have to scheme next season. If they don't have their best pass rusher at the double backer position, they're going to have to scheme a way to get to the quarterback. Um, and it's difficult, right? We saw some people have success. We had some people not have success. Like out of the spur position, maybe you see a lot more blitzing out of the spur position and they put somebody there who can get to the quarterback, unlike Anthony Jones. Um, I like where you're going with this. It's what we've been talking about as far as the need to adjust. And that's what happens in college. I mean, you're going to have moments uh, where your team and your roster and your depth chart is in flux. And for two seasons, we were very comfortable having an athletic pass rusher in Bradford. And now we're put into a position, Chance Cox. I, I I just don't think he's a good fit in this position. You know, you need to be like a quick twitch guy. And Cox right now, I mean, we've talked about it in the past, just seems like a guy that he might best serve as a five technique on this team right now. I mean, maybe he rolls into it when he gets more reps. Viliami Latou probably is the best shot at it right now of the three. Longino, to me, while he doesn't have all the weight on him, might be the most explosive of the returning lettermen on this team that could fill in the position. That's going to be it, but he's got to be able to hold up at that weight against an offensive tackle against the double team. So I feel like I'm taking on your opinion by the hour, Don. At first I was like, look, Graham is a proven defensive coordinator, a proven defensive schemer. He brings Patterson in. They saw what might be happening in terms of this whole thing in the spring and made some adjustments during practice with an emphasis on, like you said, maybe the pressure needs to start coming from different areas or maybe we need to run different base sets. I don't know whether that's the four, three or it swings to the three, three, five, they're going to have to be some adjustments made. It's like we've talked about in the past. When you look at this schedule, they got three weeks and a bye before that UCLA game. And those first three teams are not going to challenge whatever way they go. They might come out in a 4-3 base set their first week or a 3-3-5 their first week. You know how Todd Graham is. When he plays teams of lesser quality, he's not going to show off his defense, what he plans to do the following week against those bigger teams. So we're going to have to wait and see is really what it comes down to, Don. The one thing I do want to say about Longino, though, it's sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? Because you only you got you know Fiso can play on the inside linebacker, but remember DJ Calhoun, as great as he played, as fast as he played, he's six foot tall. Is he physically ready to play to you know this many games at this high level at the other starting inside linebacker position? And there's not a lot of inside linebackers on this team, right? You go go down the linebacker depth chart. You know, Matt Rowe's gone. Carlos Mendoza, they've kind of moved to spur. Maybe maybe if he's physically healthy, they do move him inside. Uh, the you know the the AJ Latu is more of a spur. Chance Cox, they want him at this double backer position. AJ uh, and, and and that's it. In the the other freshmen that are coming in are battling for the spur spot and and Christian Sam and Jamal Scott. That's it for your linebacker core. So maybe this you know Erica Florence can can figure it out and and play double backer position, giving Longino the third guy on the inside linebacker. It, it's I think it's more of a wait and see because you have so many players in position of flux and injuries and stuff. See if somebody can take it, and if not, they're gonna have to scramble. It's this is, I feel like we say this all the time, but this is definitely why coaches are getting paid. Yeah. I mean, you say it like that, Don, and who's the guy in charge of the devil backer position? That would be your new hire. So welcome, Keith Patterson. We'll see how that goes. Uh, now, you subtract one guy from the incoming class, and that means it makes room. So tell us how this all works out as far as the 2014 class concerns and scholarships. So a name that was tied to the 2014 class was this, this defensive lineman, Emmanuel Darius out of Louisiana. 
on his Twitter account, he always said he was committed to ASU and he was going to ASU and that um, Paul Randolph and him were great, you know, relationship and that he was going to ASU. And, and we had followed him on our Twitter account just out of sheer curiosity because we can count to 25 and saw, you know, or 24 and we saw 24 signings. So, what you know, okay, this guy's – and, well, you know, he follows his Twitter account and sure enough he showed up at Tempe this summer and he's working out the team and he was going to walk on. Um, but per Chris Cartman, uh, you know, ASU is, is definitely going to put this kid on scholarship. He's out of Louisiana. He's six foot two seventy. He's a defensive lineman. Um, looks like he can probably play that three technique tackle, Rob, at that size. Uh, big kid, athletic, and uh, it's just another body of the defensive line. Yeah, certainly it's a warm body, and and maybe he gives one of those other youngsters a redshirt year instead of all of them playing. I think that's what you'd look for um, in this lineup is the ability for him to step in in the second quarter towards the half, in in the third quarter, and give these guys a blow against all the fast-paced teams they're going to be playing against, Don. I mean, that's USC now, that's Washington, that's Utah, that's more than likely going to be Notre Dame, that's Washington State, that's Arizona, so... There's a ton of teams on there that are running that faster-paced offense and being able – we saw it with Oregon back in the day – being able to roll a defensive line out there uh, of of big-body guys is certainly helpful, and you talked about his size. Uh, Yeah, we'll see how it works out in uh, fall camp for him. So I I think something that we should mention here, and I know you wanted to talk about it, was – Demarius Randall posting a note thanking all of his followers on Twitter for the support, but that he was going to be shutting down his Twitter and Instagram for the season. So how do you feel about this, Don? I, you know, I, I relate it to Major League Baseball players doing this in terms of I don't want to talk about my contract status during my contract year until after the season. How do you think this whole thing is and how do you feel – Social media plays a role in what college football players should and shouldn't do. And let this be a lesson for all the learners. If you ask Rob a question, he's going to twist it around and ask you first. <laughs> um, so I was, I really don't know how I feel. Like I, I honestly kind of saw it. I thought it was interesting. I never really came around to talk to other people about it. And I forwarded it out to you and I said, I mean, so this is, I'm just shooting from the hip talking about it. Part of me thinks that it's a good thing, um, right? Because if you have that account tied to your phone, your phone is going to be continuously going off as people mention you. Uh, certainly you can turn that off, and hopefully these players do turn it off. Um, but something tells me some of them want to know what people say about them. I would. I'd want to know what people are saying about me. But I think it's just a sign of somebody who realizes what's going to happen next season. That he saw guys, he saw, you know, ear, you know, Irabor not get drafted and walk away from the game. He saw Darby not get drafted and, and struggling as, you know, as an undrafted free agent. You know, there, there, he saw, you know, four-year starters in Division One not make it to the next level. No, and, I, and this is not putting, knocking any of those guys at all. Sure. I think Randall's sure. a completely different al- athlete. I'm thinking that it's somebody who's starting to hit a maturity. And I think it's one of those things where if, if I, you could go back in time and you could go talk to yourself at 16 and you'd say, Hey, <laughs> knucklehead, you can go talk to yourself at 16 and say, knucklehead, let me tell you something. If you sit here from 16 to 23 and you just focus on your schoolwork and your sport, and your life will be taken care of for you after that, such that when you're done with football, you don't ever have to miss a party. Would you do it? Would you Would you give up, you know, being a Twitter celebrity? Would you give up 
being hosting parties in Scottsdale, would you give, you know, when you're in college, would you give that all up such that you can make it to the NFL, you can play for three years in the NFL, get in the union, and, and pretty much be set for a long time? And that way, you, you know, you'll never miss, you know, that's the thing is, is right, once you, you get your benefits and you get your pension and you get everything you want there. And then as a former NFL player, you, you, you can train, you can go to camps, you can coach, you can be a speaker, you can get an income. So you have your benefits and you can get an income. You're never going to miss another party once your playing days are over. So the question is, do you want to party your ass off now and wash out and not make it? Or do you want to sit there, strap it on, go out and do it? You know, this is going to be a big year for him. He's going to lead the entire defense. So that's going to be not only was play stand out for himself, He's got a he's got nine new starters around him. This could be a huge year for him. If the defense is half so even finishes in the mid tier of the Pac twelve, it'll be a success. And a lot of it'll have to do with his leadership. So I think this is just somebody growing up and making a decision of I'm gonna give up these little extra amenities because when I make it, I'll, I can have all the time in the world to do those type of things. Does that make sense? Using questions as an answer. You're welcome, listeners. It absolutely does. I don't think he's going to the same parties, though, after the NFL as he would during the NFL or during his college days. But I I just think sometimes if I'm a kid in college, if I go back to Rob at 20, I'm, I'm again, I am glad I didn't have social media. Whatever stupid football books I was reading back then on my free time or not on my free time. Uh, I wouldn't have gotten them if I was always thinking about getting in touch with other people every minute and a half where I wasn't in class or working. There's no way I would have read anything. I would not have read Bill Belichick's dad's book. I would not have read Don two of Bill Walsh's books. Come on. Books that have helped me get to where I am today as a guy uh, co-hosting a podcast with you. I would not have been that man. But God, I went to a lot of parties. Ugh. All right, it's time to talk about the award watches. Maxwell, here we go, Don. Awarded, obviously, best player in college football. We got three nominees uh, on ASU. Taylor Kelly, DJ Foster, also on the Paul Horning watch uh, list, by the way. And Jalen Strong, those three represent the most name to this list by any one Pac-12 school. Uh, I want to mention that again because I'm really big into this trio thing, Don. You know that. Three representatives, nominees, I know they're nominees, we joke about this all the time, but only team in the conference with three offensive nominees on the same team. And Kelly also represents the Devils for the AFCA All-State Good Works Teams nominee. That's for his volunteer and mentor work in the community. So uh, congrats to Taylor Kelly on that. We like seeing players that are well-rounded both on and off the field. You got the Bolitnikoff. That's the best wide receiver in the country. Nominee is Jalen Strong, of course. Mackey Award. Best tight end in the nation. Damari A. Nelson. NFLDraftScout.com, Don. Damari A. Nelson. Number nine preseason ranking amongst tight ends in the country. That was won last year by Austin Sperian Jenkins. And then, last but not least, Lombardi... And the Outland Trophy nominee, uh, preseason watch list, Jameel Douglas. Of course, he was second all-team Pac-12 last year. He started 27 consecutive games. That ties him with Taylor Kelly for the most uh, consecutive starts and career starts on this team. I forgot one, Don. Groza, Zane Gonzalez. Who do you think has the best shot? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight awards here we're talking about. Who do you think's got the best shot to win one of these? Crazy question of the podcast. Gonzalez. That's a good answer. That's a good one. That's a very good answer. Good job, Don. If he could only punt two right now. <laughs> hey, good. at least at least at least we know in our season preview, punter's not gonna be the first position that I, the question mark's gonna be about. Yeah. That's correct. It's good to see uh, a bunch of nominees. You know, we're not talking about Phil Steele stuff here. We're you know, we're talking about Players getting recognized before the season starts. I'm glad Jameel Douglas is on this list. 
Uh, you're going to find him amongst my uh, top 10 offensive linemen in the Pac-12 uh, this year. So, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Uh, it's good to see uh, Strong getting recognized. Uh, obviously, we want to see what it's going to be like with him having a, a year of a spring camp and a, and a fall camp uh, under his belt and, and conditioning to go with that and classroom work to go with that. So, uh, lots of good things here. All right, Don, let's uh, let's get in your wheelhouse as always. Let's talk a little bit of recruiting. We talked about June being an amazing month. Uh, ASU lands those three offensive line commits in the same day. So obviously our expectations were set very high for July. How did ASU do? We're halfway through the month. We have one verbal commit. It's a three-star tight end. Thomas Hudson gave his verbal commitment to the Sun Devils. Um, this guy had report offers from the entire Pac-12. I mean, Oregon, UCLA, Washington, Cal, Oregon State, Utah. Uh, he had some reported offers. One of the sites says Michigan State Northwestern offered him. Uh, so one of the, the better tight ends. Rob, another six foot five guy, uh, 250 pounds. Checked out his highlights last uh, couple days. His offense is a, is a power running offense, he, and he's the big run blocker for them. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to catch the highlights, Rob, but he knows how to seal the edge. But he is the biggest guy on the field. Uh, what I really like to see is that the kid has no fear. Uh, I hope it continues as it gets, goes against bigger opponents. Uh, he goes down the middle amazingly well. It looks like he's got some soft hands. He is the big red zone target for his school. And um, and I think it's a nice nice prospect. Another uh, inline tight end, kind of like Landman, the the beef, the seal, the edge, the block, but who, who's also super athletic. Um, he does line up out outside for his team every once in a while. <laughs> in fact, it was crazy. He had two little one of his highlight plays has two little shrimp wide receivers in front of him and they they throw a little bubble screen to him and he just starts plowing people over. I love that was like the Stanford play. I love that play. (laughs) It's like, wait, you're supposed to throw it to the little guy and get the big big guy blocked. But no, he's just run over people. Uh, I think the interesting part about this is he's from San Jose, Rob, Uh, another northern California verbal to ASU he he did participate in that northern california satellite camp that's where uh, tight end coach chip long found him ASU's kind of going up there and getting the players that fits their system yeah it's good to see us establishing the presence up there and and you hit the nail on the head tight end inline blocking development right now who knows what we're going to get out of Cody Cole this year but if you look at how by class it lines up that position seems to be filling out very well right now between players that are pass catching tight ends three back tight ends and inline blocking tight ends and and you talked about uh this kid's strengths as a potential inline blocker so todd graham's offense that he's always wanted to establish here tight end is soon to be the you know the feature position of players coming up through the ranks and not just what we've seen in the past with ASU where it's one outstanding player and then a bunch of uh, reserve or uh, mediocre players behind that. So outstanding depth at the position is what I'm getting at. What else has been going yeah, on? Then? The beef too. I mean, he's six foot five. I mean, look at, I, I, I'm just amazed. They're just adding big bodies. They're just, the coaching staff really wants to find big athletes and add them to the roster is pretty much what I'm determined they're doing. You know, overall, you mentioned the three offensive linemen. Looking at the class so far, the three offensive linemen stand out to me. I think they're they're all big body players. They're young. They obviously have some years of development to do physically, mentally. But there's a lot of potential in those three guys. You see it when, when all of them are going and it's a big play, they, they can play. Um I think two of them end up on the inside as a guard, but time will tell. I think pass blocking is kind of a, the big thing for them, the last thing to kind of develop. Two quarterbacks who verbaled obviously have to do with Mike Norvell. Um, you know, there's going to be a wild card. What's you know, he's he's our best recruiter. You know, and and Chip Long's right behind him. 
what happens if it's Norvell's time. And by the way, congratulations to, to Mike uh, Norvell and his wife Maria on the birth of their daughter uh, while I mentioned his name. Uh, Mila, beautiful. Mike, Maria, and Mila, beautiful daughter. Um, right now, I think I think the class and the coaches, they, they need to go out and they need to score a corner bad. Uh, I think, you know, Isaiah Langley was a guy I, th- I had high hopes for. He's friends with the Calhouns, uh, but he did give his verbal to USC. I hope ASU doesn't quit on him, recruiting him. And I actually think they do need a true safety. Uh, they, they have a lot of spurs and they have a lot of uh, – younger guys who could play safety, but I think they need a big safety. And I mentioned this before, but I, I'm of the opinion that, that they need to get a true inside linebacker in this class. Um, so I think they're filling in their depth really nicely with kids. Um, and we'll see what they do. You know, they're, they're, they're depending on how Bailey and Jones play may determine on whether one of these open scholarships left goes to a top junior college offensive tackle. Um, because both the tackles this year are seniors, so time will tell. And then, I mean, as far as everything else, I mean, where else are we looking at? There's still a bunch of big-time players left locally that I know ASU is looking at, uh, one of them being, uh, you know, Cassius Pete, a guy that we talked to Kevin Stewart about. What is going on locally amongst Arizona talent, high school talent, I should say? It's just a crazy time around here, right? You know, Christian Kirk is the top wide receiver, top player. Had a tremendous um, opening. One of the top wide receivers rated uh, electrically broke 4-4. I don't know if you saw that one, Rob. He was 4-3-7 or something electric. So um, I'd say that's fast for a high school senior. You know, if you're a betting man, a lot of people are betting that he's going to Ohio State or Texas A&M. But um, – ASU's still in his top six. With Cassius Pete, ASU's in his top six as well, but Cassius has said he's actually, um, this is the third Pete brother who's gone through this, so it should be no surprise that they're extremely professional and organized about it. He's got his top six. Um, Since ASU's in his backyard, the other five schools are getting the five official visits, uh, and he'll be going to every ASU home game. Uh, but ASU's made pitches to him. They want him at the devil backer spot, and we'll have to see how, how the, the recruiting of Pete goes. The, the news came out yesterday from our buddy Kevin Stewart that 2016 Brophy Prep standout Connor Murphy did get offered by ASU. Now, uh, Connor Murphy is Trent Murphy's younger brother, for those of you who had to sit through both of the the knockarounds by the physical knockarounds by Stanford? Trent Murphy destroyed our offensive line, uh, and Connor is his little brother, who, as a junior in high school, is standing well over six five. So ASU's the first offer. ASU wants them in, in their defense, and you know this is just another area of where ASU is doing everything they can to try to keep the local kids here. Uh, We've talked about how it's a difficult state to keep kids home. It's a younger state. Not everybody's from here. People want to get away. Uh, you can't both fault the coaching staff. They're from everything you've seen, um, and we haven't gone out and talking to parents behind the scenes and all that stuff, but everything you can physically see, the coaching staff's doing whatever they can to recruit, recruit locally. You, you know, I'm going to throw something out there as far as the situation between – Ohio State and Texas A&M and I you got to worry about Texas A&M and their situation where that coaching staff might get picked apart next year. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, there's a lot of guys on that staff that people are looking at either for college jobs or NFL jobs. So lots could change there come late December, January, right before signing day. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. And then you want to talk about change. My favorite program outside of ASU, of course, Washington State, Don. I thought we were going to talk about Colorado State. Oh, well, yeah. Well, hey, they blew the bowl game to Colorado State. Uh, mm. Is now going to be searching for another quarterback because Tyler Brugman no longer will be playing for them. Yeah, granted his release from Washington State – he may end up at Duke or Arkansas or Indiana. Very, very interesting. Go to Duke, kid. Go to Duke. 
Yeah, I, my neighbor down the street's a Wazoo alum, and he said he heard Arkansas. So uh, interesting. He, he did an interview with Kook Center, and he said it was just the not the right system for him. And that was just the, that was something that he said about ASU too. You, you know, this is something that the the signing day of 2012 will go down as just one of those crazy days, right? You know, everybody is angry at Dobbs for switching to Tennessee at the last minute. Only only the ASU coaching staff and Josh Dobbs truly know what happened. Um, whether Dobbs really just didn't talk to him at all and said, "Yeah, I'm going to ASU," and then the ASU coaches really did find out from from the Tennessee press release. Uh, I don't know. I we'll, I don't think we'll ever know. But certainly, Brugman didn't sign with Washington State until later that afternoon because whether he would stay and play for ASU or go to Washington State. And, and the reason he said he went to Wazoo is that he wanted to play for Mike Leach and air it out in that system and that he didn't feel like he was a running quarterback in, in our system. Um, so for him to say all of a sudden that the, the it was the system that's not working out, um, it was just kind of a, a shock shall we say, to me. Uh, I can tell you what's not working out, Don, watching uh, his – number one quarterback ahead of him on the depth chart gets sacked over 50 times. I think that that might be something a little bit concerning to you. If you're Tyler Brugman, I, I, I want to get his quote, right? Just, I, I just Googled it real quick. The, the quote, it wasn't about the system. He just said it wasn't a great fit. Yeah, go to Duke, go to go. Let Cutcliffe coach you. I, I, I love that coach. I think he does a fantastic job over there. Uh, not a big fan of Arkansas right now, but, uh, I mean, or go to Louisville. If you want to be a pocket passer and you're okay going to a school that might be just outside of the top 25, Duke or Louisville out East is to me, I mean, two great fits for him, but, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting, Don, when you look at the top 15 top 25 quarterback recruits over the last couple of years and their success rate, it's spotty. Mm -hmm. No Absolutely. guarantees, no guarantees at all. Look, look through that elite 11 from, you know, four years ago and you won't even know half the names that are on the list. So. All right. What do you think? You want to talk some Pac-12 running backs? Pac-12 running backs. So, Let's... Kadeem Carey, Bishop Sankey, Tyler Gaffney, Marion Grace. You all get drafted. All impact running backs. And that leaves the Pac-12 done at the running back position kind of in flux. I mean, it is 100% opposite done of quarterbacks right now. Ton of starting experience gone. And you look, and there could be six teams where – at least six teams, Don, where we can't name the, the number one running back going into late August. That's incredible to me. I don't know if I've seen anything like that since we started doing the show in the conference. Yeah, I mean, this is, for as much as everybody says it's an air and out, conf air and out conference, they've, we've had some running backs in this conference. All right, well, let's look at the list. Uh, number one was really tough, Don. You don't have one guy right now. You don't have a Marcus Mariota. You don't have this standout guy. Uh, you certainly don't have um, where, where you are right now in the Pac-12 wide receiver, uh, where you have a couple guys that are, are first round right now. It, it's, it's going to be a very interesting, uh, let's call it a Peloton, Don. Let's go to cycling. And say, in that Peloton, if I had to pick it out, Byron Marshall, Cameron's brother, junior running back Oregon. Buck Allen, junior running back USC. DJ Foster, junior running back ASU. Thomas Tyner, true sophomore now with Oregon. And, and maybe Trey Madden, but I would, I would have those four. You can't really argue those four. My number one is Byron Marshall right now. You know, he's the leading returning rusher from last season in the conference. He's the only returning 1,000-yard rusher, Don, 
uh, rushed for uh, 1,038 yards, 14 touchdowns, just 168 carries. He didn't even get to 200 carries, uh, had an injury late in the season. He was the most solid of the trio last year between DeAnthony Thomas, uh, the freshman Tyner. I'm shocked he doesn't get a little bit more hype. He was a four-star guy, but what do you expect when you got Mariota, when you got Tyner, uh, who's in that DeAnthony Thomas type mold himself? And then the guy behind the two of them on the depth chart is a freshman five-star in Royce Freeman. So he's not a huge back, but you know he got over his ball security issues last year. Uh, he's got that nice stutter and then cut, and then he's explosive in their scheme. Let's see what these Oregon running backs do, Don, behind this new – it's the same group of guys on the offensive line, minus one or two, I think, but they gained a lot of weight. That was the big push by Helfrich in the offseason, put weight on these guys and make them stronger as an offensive line to push more and get out of that little uh, – the zone crutch. So Byron Marshall's my number one guy. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not sure you could have. I mean, with the system, the running offense, and everything, I, I don't see how you could go anywhere else with with then Byron Marshall. Um, I think it's it's entirely objective. I think he's a little bit bigger, and he's probably carried a little bit more of a load. He's a little bit more proven than than DJ is, and the other guys on the list. He he plays in a system that'll be surrounded by him, and I think. Oregon has some nice receivers and everything, but I think he is the number one option. Absolutely. Uh, you know, especially after the injuries they sustained um, in the spring. And he's their guy. If you're playing uh, fantasy college football, he's the guy you want because he gets, you know, their red zone carries. He gets their goal line carries. He gets their third and short carries. At least he did going into uh, fall practice. Number two on the list, Don is Buck Allen. This is a really debatable selection between him to me and DJ Foster. But Buck Allen, big back. Originally, he was projected to play linebacker for USC. You know the kind of athletes USC brings in to play linebackers. So, and, And you know the type of pedigree USC brings in to play running back. But, you know, he got a chance last year due to the injuries with Trey Madden, Silas Red. They put him in the lineup. Ogeron slots him in. They go 7-2 and two the rest of the season after they fire Kiffin. He racks up nearly 800 yards in that time when all was said and done. And how many times did we mention him down the stretch now? We were talking about USC games. You know, he caps off his 2013 with at least 123 yards in four of the five final games. And he had that... Marion Grice-esque ability to find the end zones. Five games with at least two touchdowns on his way to 14 for the season. You know, the Trojans hadn't really seen that type of productivity out of the position since agents were allegedly none. Buying Reggie Bush family houses and uh, suitcases full of cash. So that's two touchdowns a game down the stretch. That's what he averaged. Does he become Sarkeesian's next Bishop Sankey type running back? You know, he's big and he's sneaky fast. He's not afraid of contact. They're going to play this fast-paced offense now, Don. So I expect big things out of Buck Allen. Certainly. And and he he came out of nowhere with USC. So I think that's kind of cool about it that you're – you have that much faith in him. He, he does have somebody else who will share some load. That's my only hesitation about ranking him uh, uh, this high. Uh, but certainly with, with the big bucket of them, I, I would say I like the bucket things. I think Marshall would be in the first bucket, and certainly Allen would be in that second bucket of, of running backs. So, so you would put Foster ahead of him, you think? No, I think I'd put Foster in that second bucket with him. Okay. I'm not sure. It's, to, it's, it's very hard to differentiate between the two. Yeah, I mean, I think I think ultimately Foster will probably – end up above him just because Foster's a little bit, Foster is a true one. I think Allen's a one a, and he's got mad and it's kind of like a one B. So I think when you look at the stats at the end of the season, you may, you know what I'm saying? Like the yeah. stats, Allen may have less of stats than Foster does. 
Uh, but just on talent alone, he he showed, as we said, I mean, every every week last season going through the USC highlights, it was, who is this guy? Oh, he had a good game. Who is this guy? He's had two games in a row. Who is this guy? He's had three great games in a row, you know, and he kind of just came out of nowhere and, and was the star for that team at the end of the season. Well, you definitely led into why I have DJ Foster as number three. To me... That is his floor right now, DJ Foster. DJ Foster has a shot at being, at the end of the season, number one on this list. That's his ceiling. If he stays healthy. If he stays healthy. And again, you got to remember, you're looking at two guys that I have ranked ahead of him that have put in the time as a number one back and have gotten the carries and have won games for more than two or three weeks. That's why I have DJ Foster as number three. It's it's not a penalty against him. It's just these players have done this as a running back ahead of him. Now, that being said, most versatile weapon going into 2014 at the position amongst the Pac-12. And, and that, to me, includes Thomas Tyner for that proven factor. He led the nation in receptions, 63, and receiving yards, 653 for a running back. So we know he can catch the football. He's a natural pass catcher. He runs great routes, might be the best route runner on the team. Great acceleration through the hole. All the things you're looking for in running back, and guess what? He's nearing that, if not there, going into camp, 210. Crazy to me to think that DJ Foster is right around 210 pounds. We saw what he did down the stretch. You know, he moves into that number one spot when Grice uh, breaks that, uh, that lower part of his leg. You know, big game against U of A. This is what historically over the past 20 years has built running backs, quarterbacks, defensive players. That U of A game when they're not in a starting position, but they seem to take that as a ramp going up. You know, 132 yards on 20 carries in the debacle of that was the Holiday Bowl. Uh, Yeah. You know, he probably was like the one guy before he got hurt that was our shining light against Stanford. A thing I want to point out is this. Grice, 18% of Taylor Kelly's completions last year, and he missed a couple games. Foster was a little bit gimpy in the middle of the season with that knee injury, 21% of TK's completions last year. So those two running backs, Don, 39% of Taylor Kelly's completions. That, to me, says they're still going to throw – DJ Foster the ball, and whether it's in the slot and a guy like Balage or or uh, Lewis is going to be getting the the reps at, at uh, Ace. yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just I think he's going to have numbers across the board that say somewhere in the neighborhood of thirteen hundred yards total. He'll be right there with Jalen Strong with Demarius Randall. Jameel Douglas as the best Sun Devil candidates for the NFL draft next year. So if you use the term buckets, to me, he's sitting in there with Buck Allen. Uh, I don't know how much more I can say about DJ Foster. Original member of Stay True, even though they didn't have that hashtag back then, Don. No, they didn't. They didn't. You, you, we've all heard it, right? Let, let's face it. Um, Todd Graham and, and, D, and Mike Norvell and DJ Foster have a good relationship. Um, DJ Foster was the first big recruit that, that Graham landed here at ASU, um, kept him here over USC and Cal, played him from day one as a true freshman. And he's been a, a major part of this offense with, with, along with Marion Grice. Now this is his year, and uh, you heard Graham say he wants to to get him 2,000 yards, which I cringe at because this is not the NFL. You don't have three running backs on the roster. You have six, and they all can play. You don't need to to do that to DJ, but um, I think if he can stay healthy, if he can carry that 210 pounds and stay healthy – then there really is nothing stopping him from from going to number one. This offense will be run run through him. This offense will be run at him, whatever 
little word you want to use by him. The offense will be run by him. The offense will be run at him, through him, with him. Just not in him. Just not in him, yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, you, you, when you talk about running backs, you have to put DJ Foster up there in one of the top two buckets. So that leaves us Thomas Tyner. Thomas Tyner to me, Don, is in his own dimension. Okay, whether he wants to join the rest of these guys in the third dimension, it is up to him. I mean, this is the guy I remember you talking about him when we were talking about recruiting highlights one week, and you talked about him rushing for 643 yards and 10 touchdowns in one game, Oregon high school football, everyone, his senior year, 2012. So last year, uh, 711 yards, uh, not a big deal, just the most ever by a true freshman in Oregon history. Uh, third leading rusher on the team behind Cam's little brother and Mariota. So there's only so many carries they're going to have. But if you remember, this is what Oregon does. They're all about that one-two combination plus a quarterback. It worked for them in spades back in 2010, 2011 with Kenyon Barter and LaMichael James. No reason it can't happen now. Two touchdowns on four carries in his opening game against Virginia. Uh, with Marshall Hurt in the Civil War, he had 140 yards rushing and a touchdown against the solid Oregon State defense. So he's fast. He ran unofficially, I think, what was it, around like a 4-3-5. He set the state record in high school running a 10-3-500 meter. So he can catch the ball. He can run. You know, the question is going to be, does he have that killer instinct? He's a five-star. We know what happened on this team last year. There was a couple guys that when the national championship dream went away, they kind of shut down. This guy kept playing, especially when Marshall got hurt. So Tyner is just an explosive guy. There's three guys in that backfield that make it so much that I – I'm very happy ASU misses Oregon this year because I can't even imagine a run defense going against those three guys. It's insane, plus a quarterback that can run when you don't take his knee out from under him. I mean, what else is there to say about this guy? He's amazing. He has all the tools. He's young. He's a five-star. Um Certainly, he has another chance to be very special. So I think what you're saying, you know, what we summarize here is that there's a lot of talent that's just unproven yet at the Division One level. Right, and and then there's there's lots of question marks. So Trey Madden is a guy. He was kind of like Buck Allen. They recruited him as a linebacker, and he you know he turned it around, became a running back, just stayed with being a running back. Finishes with 700 yards. He was the guy in the first half of the season. This was Kiffin's guy. 100-yard game. Uh, first four of the five games, I think it was. Uh, they also got Justin Davis and, and Ty Isaac there, you know. But Madden's going to be like their third down guy. Good ca- guy that catches the ball in the backfield. UCLA, Jordan James, probably going to be their go-to guy. But they got Paul Perkins, too. They got a couple other guys. And, you know, this is also with Miles Jack. Jim Morris saying Miles Jack is not going to run the football in 2014. We'll see what happens because Jack and Brett Hundley combined for somewhere around 600 of the team's 1,000 rushing yards. And this is a team that went crazy its first couple of games last year. I think they were 13th in the nation right around there after the month of September. They were averaging 250 yards rushing a game, Don. So Noel Mazzoni wants to run the football. But we know how he is very much a mad scientist when it comes to building successful offensive game plans that utilize the strengths of his team. Frustrating, one way or another. Uh, other guys to talk about, Bubba Pool with Utah. Storm Woods and Teron Ward with Oregon State. Uh, they got a new offensive coordinator. We talked about that last episode. Uh, it's Jason Garrett's older brother, John Garrett. He's trying to kind of sharpen this thing up a little bit because – he doesn't got Marcus Wheaton, and he doesn't got Brandon Cooks, Don. So they got a good pass-catching tight end, but they're going to have to run the football to win. Who's the running back at Stanford? We're going to find that out in the next couple weeks. Is it Barry Sanders Jr., Kelsey Young, Ricky Seal? It's going to be the guy that can hold on to the football and the guy that can do blitz pickups because none of these guys excel 
at, at picking up the blitz right now. But they also haven't spent the time in the offense. So we'll see what happens there. Colorado, we talked about them. Their offense is a train wreck. Christian Powell is the junior Nigerian nightmare. You know, he's six foot two thirty. Michael Adkins is like the speedy guy, but no Paul Richardson. They're kind of like Oregon State. And then there's Cal. They are very similar to Washington State where they try to run the football, it doesn't work, and then they don't run the football for two quarters. So I don't know how much you can expect out of a guy like Kalfani Mohammed. He's a track guy. Uh, we'll see how he teams up with Lasko. Do you see anybody out of that group, Don, that you think is going to sneak up into that maybe nipping at the heels of six? I don't see anybody yeah. there. Barry Sanders. You think it's Barry Sanders with that offensive line? It, well, that's it exactly. That's with the offensive line. I mean, he's going to be able to go right through everything. You know, it's it's interesting you picked him because I had no idea last year with Gaffney. I mean, we thought they were going to go with a committee approach, and then Gaffney's getting 35 carries a game. So it could happen with Sanders. Absolutely. And then that's that's sort of it, right? I mean... Yeah, I would say he's your high ceiling guy out of the group as far as opportunity plus ability because you don't see that combination anywhere else amongst those guys. And we didn't even talk about Arizona. I mean, nobody knows right now who's going to step in. You just know that that system produces good running backs. Oh, definitely. So lots of question marks. Uh, These, I guarantee you, are going to lead to a lot of our questions Uh, When we talk to people that cover these Pac-12 schools, not name Oregon, not name USC, Don, uh, that's really it. I mean, outside of that, you're going to really have to, I I guess maybe Utah with Bubba Poole, uh, you know for sure he's probably going to be their starting running back, but that's it. All these other schools have questions at the running back position as far as who's going to be the guy, unless again, you're Cal or Washington State, that's going to touch the ball 20 times a game. So it's enough to make you want to watch a lot of early season Pac-12 football outside of what ASU does. So, all right, with that, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and talk with Pete Romito of quarterbackhitlist.com. I want to leave here and maybe just get lost way up north in the Keweenaw, desperately intending to spend a little time Getting rid of most of me and working on my mind. Oh, mother, have I lost my mind? You can find me. Nothing has caught the attention of fans more this current recruiting cycle than ASU's ability to secure the services of one Brady White and one Bryce Perkins for their 2015 class. And Pete Romito is the lead evaluator for quarterbackhitlist.com. He now joins us to talk about these two quarterbacks while filling us in on this latest Elite 11 competition. Welcome to the Devil's Den, Pete. Hey, thanks a lot, Ralph. Uh, Great to be here. So let's start with this young man from California, Hart High School senior quarterback Brady White, the jewel verbal commit so far of Todd Graham's 2015 class. Had a successful Elite 11 Finals. We saw him at number one, I think it was, on day two. Finishes up fourth uh, among the best high school quarterbacks in the country. For our listeners, Pete, that are unfamiliar with White, uh, from what was observed during the Elite 11, from what you've seen on tape, can you kind of talk about his strengths, his main areas uh, uh, as well that you think he needs to focus on improving during his senior year before he uh, fulfills his commitment? Yeah, the, the one thing I noticed first, um, actually I was doing evaluations of like the 2015 uh, pro-style quarterbacks, and then I came across Brady's uh, film and noticed, you know, just, I mean, he was basically just an unbelievable talent. I mean, he had, he can do anything on the field. I mean, he's he's kind of like the it factor when it comes to quarterbacks. Um, you know, he's very patient in the pocket. He works well, um, you know, when, when the blitz is on. He gets the ball off quickly, extremely accurate. Um, he's, he's able to spread the ball around and, um, yeah, I mean, and, and he can run. So he, he's got, he's got all the abilities and the potential to be a great quarterback at Arizona state, um, especially in the, um, 
zone read offense, kind of what he's um, doing with right now with the high school, the high school level. So I, I think one of the big questions as he announced my verbal will be uh, towards ASU was that where does he fit in with this offense? You know, you see a quarterback right now, Taylor Kelly going into his third year as a starter, and he's known for being a, a read option quarterback uh, with solid accuracy. But, you know, the, the emphasis of the offense right now is more under Mike Norvell is basically to run that, that zone read and be efficient in your short to in intermediate route. So where does someone like Brady White fit into that offense? Because when you say he's a pro-style quarterback, we think about the Taylor Brugmans of the world that turned down ASU a couple of years back because it didn't seem like pro-style quarterbacks would be a fit in Mike Norvell's offense. So that's the thing about Brady White. I mean, he's labeled a pro um, QB. But if you watch his film and you also see him at various camps, he's got, you know, great footwork and he's got quickness. I mean, he's he's rated at a four six eight forty, um, which is which is pretty good. Um, and he's also has the ability to run as well. He ran for three hundred and sixty some yards last year, his senior or his uh, junior year, and also I think it was like six touchdowns. So he's not just a drop back type quarterback. He has the ability to run when given the opportunity. It was just in the high, in the high school level. Um, it was more of a passing offense at Hard High School, and he threw for about 500 and he had about 520 some attempts. So a lot more pass oriented versus run. But Brady is far more than capable of being a, a run quarterback. Now we look at the local talent among this this class: uh, Chandler Highs, Bryce Perkins. Obviously, this is a program that has churned out a, a couple uh, successful college quarterbacks in the last five to ten years. The guy's got a tremendous athletic frame. He he seems to be working really hard on developing himself as a passer. As can be witnessed, you look at those YouTube videos of him training with uh, former NFL quarterback Dan Minucci. He's one of the more respected quarterback coaches locally. Have you seen enough development from Bryce Perkins as he enters his senior year to consider him a, a true candidate as a college quarterback? You know, there has been improvements um, since last season as far as the development. He's been attending the camps, also doing various training. Um, they're still labeling him as a developmental quarterback. I mean, he's got good size. He's got a good arm strength. Um, he can make all the passes, but he just needs a little more development. So he needs um, more training. Hopefully this season will help him um, to improve. But right now they're, he's kind of being looked at as a recruit, as a receiver, as well as a quarterback. But uh, Arizona State said, um, you know, when he's uh, on campus, he's going to give it every opportunity to um, to fight for the position at QB. Now, I like where you're going with that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But coming into this, uh, this past year's recruiting cycle, uh, the quarterback position obviously was pinpointed as, as one of the major areas of need, Pete, with only one scholarship player at the position coming back for the 2015 season. ASU signs two quarterbacks in the class of 2014. That, of course, is Manny Wilkins and Colton Gerhardt. You know, officially, ASU offered Gerhardt as a safety, but they quickly changed that offer to quarterback during his senior year. What do you see in a guy that made, you know, this change as far as the offer? What do you see in Colton Gerhardt? Uh, Colton's very athletic. I mean, he, he has... The size, first of all, is about 6'1", 216. He's got great speed at 4.65 out of 40. And um, he can run the offense well. I mean, he's got a very good arm. And, and he also can throw in, you know, the running ability on that zone, um, zone read type offense. So he's got the ability to play quarterback. I know other colleges were looking at him as the safety as well. But, again, Arizona State's like, you know, come on in and then we're going to give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, compete with Manny Wilkins and the other QBs to – turn the spot well and then there's Wilkins you know himself an elite 11 finalist as well uh one of the vocal leaders of the 2014 ASU recruiting class you know doing his best uh by social media to get others to follow his lead outside of his positive attitude and his presence can you speak on his behalf as far as his strong points as a passer because as we're going to start to talk about here this is a guy that potentially has a shot 
of making it next year as a, a push for a starting quarterback next year. Yeah, he's got a lot of a lot of great uh, attributes at QB. Not just being a dual quarterback, you know, with the running aspect, but he's got a great like he's got an over the top delivery. Um, he's got good footwork in the pocket. Um, he's consistently looking downfield. Um, you know, unlike other dual quarterbacks, he actually you know prefers to stay in the pocket and throw versus run. So he's always looking for an opportunity to make a pass prior to just leaving the pocket. Um, you know, he's also good ball placement. I mean, he's always throwing away from the defender, and he's very calm, very calm in the pocket um, when running the offense. Well, let's start to take a look now how these four players start to fit into the 2015 and 2016 season. So let's fast forward a year. It's now 2015. You and I are talking a year from now. You have an organizational soldier in Mike Bercovici who could have transferred out to get a starting job somewhere else, uh, behind Taylor Kelly, he declined. You know, we'll have seen him for three years in Mike Norvell's system. Um, can Berkovici, you know, hold off these four talented young quarterbacks? I, I know it's it's tough to predict what's going to happen over the course of the next 365 days, but there's, it, it, there's just such an influx of young talent. Do you see any of these guys being able to start right away? Um, I see, you know, as far as the developmental point of it, I mean, we've got Brady White, who's, you know, kind of undersized. I mean, six foot two, one eighty six, and then also Manny Wilkins around one eighty. So, I mean, there's possibilities maybe redshirting them, you know, in order to, you know, to bulk up and and to, you know, work their way into the system. But I'm looking at these guys. I mean, these four guys that we're mentioning to be to be in there. I mean, you know, once once Kelly is gone, I think these guys are going to be the ones who are competing for the starting role, and it, it's a really good uh, competitive group. So that being said, you know I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. Come 2016, is it Brady White? I mean, I mean, is it obviously with his rating, uh, what we've seen in the Elite 11? Is that the guy that you think best shot? If he, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's it's tough to guess, but you're the guy that sees all the tape and and values these guys, what they're good at, what they aren't. I mean, would he be the front runner? Yeah, I mean, I really can't, I can't really speak for the other three, but I'm pretty well been watching over the last, maybe she's following him over the last four months. I mean, at the end of last year and then into his camps. And um, just last week he competed in the 7-on-7. Um, seven seven. It was the Edison Tournament in California. And they won the tournament. Hard High School beat St. John Bosco, which is um, Josh Rosen's school. Um, so, he, I mean, he is still on. He, he's, got, he's got it. I mean, when you look at a quarterback and you see him on film, that's one thing, but then you see him in camps and it's like, okay, this guy is the real deal. I mean, I think Brady is the one who can lead Arizona State, you know, to to greatness again. I mean, I believe that. I think um, Bryce Perkins is going to compete as he develop as of right now. No, but the good thing is, you know, there's potential in being a receiver. Um, Manny Wilkins is the, is I think the second um, runner up. I think Manny can fight or can battle with Brady White as far as competing for the starting role between those, it's going to be between those two. So one of the big uh, scary moments, I would say, uh, before Mike Norvell got his new contract uh, to be the deputy head coach uh, at ASU was, will ASU lose this very young, very innovative offensive coordinator? ASU signs him up. He gets a big raise. And now you're starting to see, you know, the fruits of his effort bearing in his trips around the nation recruiting. I guess my question is, is I, I don't know if, if you've seen the impact of Mike Norvell, but what can you say about this guy, you know, in respect to recruiting and coaching a quarterbacks? What is it about this guy? He's a wide receiver in college, you know, and yet he's gotten two of the top quarterbacks to sign in 2014 and two more verbal for 2015. If, if there's one thing I can say about Mike is, you know, he was basically one of our first followers. So you got this guy who is, you know, a highly you know, regarded offensive coordinator um, and he's following, you know, a quarterback blog. It's like, okay, so he's searching everywhere to, to find the players. So that says something about him right there. Um, also, he's got the offense that is kind of like 
I don't know, it, it's kind of like eye candy to these quarterbacks. I mean, you look at this offense like, oh, my gosh, you know, there's so much going on here. I mean, and, and they're kind of the focus of the offense. So that's why they are bringing in these offensive players. Um, if you look at these past um, commitments that Arizona State has over this, over this year, 2006, 2015, there's 12 players that have committed already. Nine are on the offensive side. You have one defensive and two athletes. So that tells you right there that Nor- Norvell is really just pushing to get these recruits you know, on board. Um, and it shows. I mean, as far as him being the, you know, the top recruit in the Pac-12, no, he's not the top, but he, he's number two right now. I mean, so he's doing his job. I mean, he's just relentless. Mike Norvell scouring the internet. We like to hear that, Pete. All right. My, my co-host and I, we always joke about how immature we were between our, our junior and senior year of college, Pete, college, let alone high school. Often you hear about these late bloomers, the players that found their way uh, to the quarterback position from other positions late in high school, or how something just clicked in their development scheme. You know, from your perspective, how hard is it to, evel- uh, to evaluate these young quarterbacks at a younger and younger age? Because to be quite honest, you know, if you go back to, let's say, 2012, for every Jameis Winston, there seems to be a Gunnar Keel, a Matt Davis, a Zach Klein, guys that their original staff, it just doesn't work out. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's extremely hard to evaluate, especially at, at the early ages. Um, you know, we do on our site, we're actually evaluating the 2017s. Um, wow. You know, so we're going back through, like, you know, freshman year, you know, watching film. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you've got to see something there. There's got to be something there that, you know, is separates them from the others. And, and you know, it's, you know, I, I think I feel at those ages, it's still too young. I mean, every year they're getting better and better and better until they reach, I think, the peak moment is like after junior season they go into the camps and then right into their senior year that that's kind of like it that's where you know where they stand you know from junior to senior i mean you can pretty much pinpoint you know how well they're going to be in college at that point and where but, but you, you look i'm sorry go ahead well no please go ahead no you, you look at like just all the different attributes that present on the field while they're playing I and mean, they could be the leadership it could be decision making i mean just their patience their confidence. I mean, those kind of things. I mean, those are what, what a quarterback is made of. And, and I guess w- while you're evaluating, where do these seven on seven leagues fit in to all this? I mean, you know, there's lots of people, especially out on the West coast for PAC 12 schools uh, that are big supporters of seeing the development of quarterbacks in these seven on sevens. Where do you stand with them? This is actually, I'm from the, uh, from the West in Ohio. So this is kind of the first time I've actually, um, you know, been a part of these seven and sevens. I mean, so I, I've seen, you know, quite a bit already over this past few months. But for me, the seven and sevens really doesn't give you the full picture. I mean, it, it's kind of – I think it's an easy way for a quarterback just to, you know, look good because you've got, you know, so many receivers out there, you can pretty much pick and choose. So is it the, you know, the type of um, – exercise you want to evaluate, you know, and, and kind of label the person as, okay, this guy's really good. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it, it's good to have. It's something additional to everything else, but it's not something you should, you should like, um, you know, put your head on and say, okay, this is, you know, this is this for this quarterback, and this is how he's going to be in college. No. Take, so basically take it with a grain of salt, but, but it shows you things. They're great for highlight films, that's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I want that, That's one of the things – I mean, I noticed that in the uh, elite, the elite eleven finals in the opening. I mean, Brady White, kind of like he just carried over what I saw in film onto the seven and seven. I mean, the most important thing on seven and seven is decision making and quick and quickness. You know, I noticed a lot of the quarterbacks were throwing, um, you know, just check down passes. You could tell they were just not comfortable with like taking a risk. Brady White wasn't afraid to take risks, and he threw it downfield. And it was like, wow, he was kind of like separated from everybody else because of that. And we'll see if uh, one of his targets ends up uh, with ASU. It's going to be it's going to be a dogfight uh, to to grab more of the uh, wide receiver talent. But I, I want to tie a bow around what we've been talking about, Pete. You know, from the start, uh, and that's the current state of college football uh, with the quarterback position. Unless you're a Nick Saban. 
and Alabama, it seems like you can't win without a standout talent at quarterback. And I don't want to, you know, shadow anything that any of the players that have played quarterback at Alabama, because there's been a, a bunch of really solid ones. They just haven't been, you know, the star of the offense. Obviously that's always going to be the running back behind those offensive lines. But if you look, 12 of the last 14 Heisman Trophy winners have been quarterbacks with only Reggie Bush and Mark Ingram grabbing that heralded award uh, during this quarterback era. So my question to you is to close this, is it the new offenses? Is it the explosion of social media adding to the hype around the quarterback? What's your take in regards to this with teams? I think, um, I mean, when we first started that blog, we actually were, were Friday night recruits and we did um, recruiting information on all the positions. And then we started noticing, okay, wait a minute, everything, everybody's gravitating towards the quarterback. I mean, you, you notice that. You notice it in social media. You notice it in everywhere. I mean, that is the person that, you know, the public is most familiar with. Um, so when you talk about recruits, you know, same thing. I mean, you look at like a Torrance Gibson. I mean, he's all over the media. I mean, everybody knows about him. He's all over the nation. You know, all the fans are like trying to buy for his attention. So, yeah, the quarterback is a highly focused position, and more so, I think, than ever before um, because of, like, the draft. I mean, if you look at the NFL draft, the, the top players they're talking about were QBs, and that's pretty much what the public knows about, you know, those players. So there's a lot of pressure on these, these young kids coming out of high school to, to be able to step up that quickly into college and, and to be, you know, the center of attention and, and receive that spotlight. We'll tease your site just for a second. 2016. We haven't talked about 2016. Give our listeners some quarterbacks to think about uh, on the horizon. Oh, we're actually going through them right now. Uh, we're evaluating 2016 pros, and then now we're going into the duels. But, I mean, as I was evaluating the 2016 players, they are nothing. no knock on the 2015s. These guys are impressive. I mean, there's going to be a whole bunch of players that, you know, the college will be will be going after. I mean, as far as certain players, I mean, there's so many there's so many to mention. I, I mean, it, it's gonna be a great class, and I think you know, for Arizona State, this is gonna be another class that they're gonna have to look at and really like, you know, I think it's gonna be a good chance to take out another great potential quarterback. Well, Pete Romito is the lead evaluator for QuarterbackHitList.com. It's a site that offers its readers accurate evaluations and recruiting information on quarterbacks playing in high schools all across the country. You heard Pete say going to 2017 already. You can follow the site on Twitter at QB hit list. Pete, thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate all the information. All right. Thank you very much. Rob. Great to see you. Search points is in the bottom. That's where the poor fool drowned. He lost his mind somewhere in Colorado. Still waiting to be found. Under the villa, the life she once loved. She's screaming, Catch me if you can. He'll follow her through a love she once knew. As if we somehow understand. Son, it's time to talk about swim through frequencies. They're a five piece indie folk band out of Fort Collins. Their EP is Rhythm of Complacency. It's their first full length album. It's derived from a folk rock rhythm. It's layered with introspective lyrics and catchy melodies. The album's got a unique voice and theme. What else would you expect? out of a couple of guys from Fort Collins, Don. Uh, The song we opened up our show with, Other Languages, to me, it's a track that really has a good shot of being a song you hear on the radio one day. Uh, It's a really good indie folk rock song. Um, So you never know. That's that's the beauty of having these indie bands on the show, Don. Uh, You can buy Rhythm of Complacency, the EP, as well as other songs of Swim Through Frequencies on iTunes. You can go to their website, You can check them out on Facebook, find out when their next shows are. You can buy their music and follow them on Twitter. Swim through. And then like any handle on Twitter that's got a really long name, they had to shorten it. F-R-E-Q-U-N-C. So 
big thanks to Clay uh, for getting in touch with us, and uh, best of luck uh, this summer uh, with the shows you guys play. We obviously both watched a lot of soccer. God, I had to go to two weddings this month. I didn't. I didn't watch that much soccer. You didn't watch that much soccer. It was. Uh, it was tough. We had to break down. Had the games on in the conference room. Went the streaming approach at first. Worked really well with all games not America. And then you put Team USA on and ESPN streaming. Not so good. I'm excited to say they're opening a new German style microbrewery near me, Don. Uh, in uh, in honor of Die Mineshaft for tonight, I'm drinking heliocentric Hefeweizen out of Odyssey. I don't even know what that says. I think it says Beer Works. It's out of Arvada, Colorado, about an hour south of me. Know a bunch of people that live in Arvada. They always want me to come hang out and seem to forget it's about an hour to an hour and a half drive in traffic. Uh, really good. Haven't had a Hefeweizen in a while. A uh, pure Hefeweizen. Uh, it's pretty solid. It's a solid beer. Uh, I think I said I was going to drink an IPA on this show, and as usual, I lie and I apologize. What have you been drinking, Don? Well, for the month of June, I'm going to make the beer week my what was really my month of June beer. We're going to go with the uh, Firestone Walker Brewing Company 805. Is this, this beer just... It's it's named after na- their area code, Dato Five. This is the one in Illinois, Firestone. No, this is the one in uh, California. Okay. Out near Solvang, it's uh, you know, it's just it's it's Dato Five. It's it's just a simple golden ale, blonde ale, you know, clear gold beer. You got the white head. Tastes is smooth, little citrusy. It was weird though. It's it's a, a, a simple blonde ale, it was, but it was kind of. I couldn't throw them down as comfortable as I could. Some other uh, a blonde ales, it kind of does have a little bit to you once you swallow it and get it in your stomach. Um, but it was just fun. My light body beer that you just drink uh, outside and the, and the beautiful. Uh, 50 degree night when you get off work type. I was, type I was gonna say, is this what the good people of Siberia drink at night? Siberia, <laughs> yes, uh, yes. That that was uh, what our bartender uh, Sunny gave us is the 805. Now this is the local beer towards. Uh, this is where you were. Yes. Very nice. I I like Firestone. There's there's like three different Firestone breweries. Just so you know. This one is the Firestone Walker. Yes. I'm, Brewing Company. I'm glad you specified. It's very confusing because there's a Firestone near me as well. And every time I see Firestone, I'm like, oh, it's a local beer. And then you find out it's either the one in Illinois, which is fantastic. And I think I've had it on the show before. And then there's this one. So very nice. Well, I'm glad you drank that. I'm disappointed you did not try the um, Rasputin that I had a, a couple months ago, the Rasputin Stout. I would think that would be the beer of Siberia, but I know that they also don't like Rasputin anymore out there. So I drank a lot of Moretti. It didn't work. I uh, drank it the first game. They won. I drank it the second game. They drew. And we don't need to talk about the uh, third Italian match against Uruguay. Why not? Did you get hungry? Oh, that would be the second. That, yes. Yes. That would be the second match. But yes. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I don't, yes, it's time to move on. All right. I just want to. I want to buy the Barcelona shirt with his number, with the bite mark in his number. I. You know what? I. I don't get it. I don't. I. I don't get it. I don't understand. Barcelona is. I hate to go on a rant down. Barcelona is supposed to be this team that is all about. They're more than just a club. Uh, they're about uh, a way of living outside of playing and all this stuff and. They have higher morals than every other team in the world. And then they sign a guy that's a racist and a biter. Uh, the whole team, it, the whole point of the team is they grew up together and they played in the academy together. And the three starters on your front line are all from South America. So if you're a Barcelona fan, I would like for you to defend that signing. And I would like for you to defend the point of the majority of the team is uh, – is from that region because 
I don't see that right now. Hey, hey, go ask Hubner. Yes, that's a great idea. Well, he's he he's a Ronaldo fan, so he's a Real Madrid guy. Yeah. But we'll see what he says. Because we know how good uh, Cristiano did in this World Cup. Made me very happy, Don. Very happy. Mm-hmm. And on that note, we're the AC Devils then. You can catch us uh, getting soon to getting uh, weekly, Don. Hope you're getting your beauty sleep in. God knows we won't get much more of it soon between you having uh, a second small Hanson and uh, us doing shows every week uh, up until late July. And then we'll go back to doing our weeklies. We'll get in, uh, we're getting ready for the preview sessions. Uh, get ready to be going to uh, fall camp and covering from there. Uh, don't forget, as always, talked about it earlier. Send us your emails to the crap part of Fort Collins. You'll hear from me. You can talk with Don on Twitter, Facebook. Got to catch up. Go to Facebook, like us, tell your friends. If you don't like what you listen to on here, tell your enemies and get them to like us on Facebook. We're okay with that. Um, Don't forget, as always, go to iTunes, rate and review us. Swim through frequencies. We just talked about them. Big thanks for them being the band of the week on our show, as well as our guest, Pete Romito from quarterbackhitlist.com. Go to dieharddevil.com. Don and I are there. You can sign in. You can talk about all sorts of things. You can get a cool badge. If you're a student and you're part of a group that goes and watches games together, you can get your badge on there. If you're part of the Alumni Association or Sun Devil Club contributor, you can get that badge on there. If you're a Mustache Nation guy, see you on September 5th. In horrible Albuquerque. Still not looking forward to going to Albuquerque, but I am looking forward to watching that game and uh, talking with a bunch of people at the tent. But you can continue the conversation. You want to talk about preseason. You want to talk about recruiting. You want to talk about games. All those sorts of things. Go on there to the forum and uh, just start up our post or reply to another one. It's as simple as that. So thanks for listening to the show. Obviously, Don and I don't have a show if people like you don't listen to us. So we appreciate you listening. Uh, Spread the word. Go on all these social media networks and let people know that you listen to us uh, because it'll help us keep doing this thing. Otherwise, me and Don are going to say screw it and not come back next episode. So there you have it. God's honest truth, Don. We're not coming back unless you do that sort of thing. Uh, The blackout and the maroon monsoon have been announced, Don. Do you want to tell us when they are? Uh, Blackout is the UCLA game. Yep, September 25th. Uh, Maroon Monsoon. Third annual Maroon Monsoon, Don. Against your favorite, Big Boys. Uh, Stanford on the 18th of October. Oh. You going to go to that game? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You got two tickets, two season tickets this year, or just one? I just won. Thank you. Yeah. Did you find yeah. somebody to warm that seat? No, it's, it's it's an empty seat. All right. The the, the section's kind of empty. Uh, I can find you a seat or a person to fill that uh, for homecoming. Oh, that'd be sweet. But we'd be sitting by ourselves. Everybody's gone. Really? Everybody's gone. So no one else re-upped. I don't think so. Holy cow. Wow. All right. That's live. Uh, that's live internet radio for you. It's riveting right there. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Don and I's life as, as the world turns. Oh yeah. As we close out this episode. All right. We'll be back in a few weeks. I'm going to get sad now and drink a lot before I go to sleep. Uh, on that note, uh, episode 85 on the way fall camp heats up right before that. We'll be talking pack 12 wide receivers and tight ends. We might even get to a preview of another school, Don. Not sure yet. Got to get those interviews locked down and confirmed. But until then, enjoy the time off. Enjoy the sun. If you're out there camping, have a beer and a hot dog for me. And uh, Don, good to have you back. Go Devils. Great to be back. Thanks, buddy. Where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? It's been a while. You've given in. I've given in. Survival, but I'm too lonely to 
drink about it now So I'm sure that I let you down Where have you been? Where have you Cause the dying don't say much once they are dead So you might as well say what needs to be said Where are you now? Where are you now? Yeah, I know that I'm so far away from home But it sure feels good to be alive Drink about it now So I'm sure